Ishbosheth is murdered. Mephibosheth is introduced. David rules over all Israel, fights and defeats the Philistines twice, after inquiring of the Lord twice, learns to worship God in the beauty of holiness. And Peter preaches the gospel once again, this time to the religious rulers. Today on 3 in 1, as we consider 2 Samuel chapters 4 through 6 and Acts chapter 5. Intense reading today, huh? Murder, mayhem, revenge, retribution, war, imprisonment, and above it all, the availability of, the power of, the Holy Spirit. Available to those who have ears to hear. Ears to hear. Can you, can you hear what's going on all around me? Today the pulpit is on top of the rooftop of a building overlooking New York City. I'm so glad to be able to read my Bible anywhere at any time and then overflow with the Spirit of God anywhere, anytime. And I'm so thankful for the privilege of being able to share the overflow with you. So today we're talking about the Holy Spirit being available to those who have ears to hear, minds ready to receive, and hearts that desire to trust and obey. And, and right there is the adventure. Our reading today started with the death of Ishbosheth. Once again, some ill-informed malefactors thought that David would be happy if they brought him the head of his enemy after murdering him in his sleep. But once again, David had too much respect for the office and ultimately primarily for the Lord to rejoice after such an act. In fact, the way that he reacted was exactly like he did when an Amalekite said that he killed Saul. Well, not exactly. He actually was a bit more brutal with these guys after their unrighteous act. But before all of this happened, we were introduced in our reading today to a very interesting man, a man named Mephibosheth. Now take special note of this man who actually was not yet a man in this chapter. He was a young boy, but we'll meet him again in the chapters to come. Take special note of who he is and whose he is and what exactly happened to him. See, Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son. Mephibosheth was Saul's grandson. Mephibosheth ran from the current king, David, after dynasties changed hands not understanding the character of the king, not understanding the covenant that the king had made. And in running away from the king, he fell. And in the fall, he became lame, unable to walk, unable to come to the king on his own. Oh, what a message there is in this man named Mephibosheth. But we'll have to wait for the fulfillment of his story in the pages to come. Now, as chapter five began, David began to rule over all of Israel after if Ishbosheth was killed. And he ruled over all Israel from Hebron, that is, until he conquered Jerusalem. The Jebusites who ruled over Jerusalem were mocking him, and in arrogance they felt as though the city was impenetrable. But David, a brilliant military strategist by this point, chose to sneak in under the outside wall through the water shaft. And once he defeated the Jebusites, Jerusalem became his headquarters. Jerusalem, which means city of peace. A beautiful, small city at the time on top of Mount Moriah. The same mount Abraham intended in obedience to offer Isaac upon until the angel of the Lord stopped the knife. The same mount that another father offered another son almost 2,000 years later, but this time no one stopped the sacrifice. Jerusalem. Now, when the Philistines found out that David was ruling unchallenged in Israel, they stepped up not only to challenge him, but to destroy him, gathering for war in the valley of Rephaim. And as we said before, David was, by this point, a brilliant military strategist, but he knew that no strategy of man could stand against the wisdom of God. So David inquired of the Lord, Lord, do you want us to go up and fight these Philistines? And the Lord answered, go up for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. And that's exactly what happened. David went straight up and fought the Philistines and God delivered the Philistines into his hand. Now, a few verses later, the exact same circumstances repeated themselves. Same enemy, the Philistines, same, battles, same battlefield, the Valley of Ephraim. And this is where the real temptation and possible trap was. Why? Because like we said, David, a brilliant military strategist already asked God what to do with this enemy in this location once before, and he was victorious. So there would be a serious temptation to rely on previous experience or prior direction. 
But once again, David defies conventional wisdom and honors God by asking once again, God, do you want us to go up and fight these Philistines? And good thing he asked God, because here was God's answer. You shall not go up, circle around behind them and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go up before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. Can you imagine receiving a revelation like that? Can you imagine communicating a revelation like that to your military men? They would think you had been hit on the head one too many times in battle, but can you imagine when it actually happened exactly like God said it would happen? Can you imagine how full of faith his military men would be when they actually heard the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, knowing that God is going before them? Now here is the best part, for this is what God saved us for. More than just military strategy, more than just victory, God saved us for fellowship with him. And fellowship with God is an adventure. When you ask him what to do, and then he leads you, and you listen, and it all happens exactly as God said that it would, wow! What a great God that we serve. You might end up on a rooftop of a building in New York, talking into the air, trusting that God's gonna deliver the gospel all over the world. And the fact that God would use you, the fact that God would fellowship with you is such amazing grace. Now, if David would have started chapter five, like he ended chapter four, he could have saved himself and others a lot of pain and aggravation. As you read today in chapter five, David went to recover the ark in order to bring it to Jerusalem, but he didn't inquire of the Lord this time. He just took matters into his own hands and did it his way, which led to pain and tragedy. Then, just like us, he became angry with the Lord for being the Lord, for being holy. Then another emotion flooded his soul. He became afraid of God, who is holy. He developed a holy fear of God, which led him to do things the right way, which led him to do things the Lord way, as David was learning to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Holiness, holy set apart to seek God with ears to hear, minds ready to receive and hearts that desire to trust and obey. And there, right there, is the adventure. There is joy. There is true joy when we learn to truly worship God in the beauty of holy obeying God, in the beauty of holiness. And everyone could see it in David's face as he danced with great joy before the Lord, just so thankful for the Lord, for the Lord's leading in his life. Well, as we transition to our New Testament reading in Acts chapter 5, we are introduced to a couple that did not have a holy fear of God, who did not wholly obey God, lying about their offering. They did not worship God in the beauty of holiness. And God, who knows men's hearts, confronted them, as you read today, through the apostle Peter, asking Ananias, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? As then he fell over dead with his wife joining him about three hours later for the same reasons, lying to the Holy Spirit about how much they gave to God. Can you imagine if God did this today with us on a regular basis? Our churches would become mortuaries really quickly. Well, needless to say today, although he may not strike anyone dead in our Sunday services, his heart is grieved just the same. Now, the result of all of this was that a holy fear fell upon the believers that gathered together as they were wholly committed to God. And often, where there is faith-filled purity, God pours out his power, which is exactly what we read today as a result in the middle of chapter 5. Then, at the end of chapter 5, the religious rulers once again arrested the apostles. And 
we didn't address it in our last episode, but we read in chapter four how Peter boldly said to the religious authorities, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak of the things which we have seen and heard. So not knowing what to do in chapter four, they just let him go, commanding them not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus. So being let go, they gathered together with the other believers and asked God for boldness to preach and teach in the name of Jesus saying, now Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now notice that they did not ask for God to end the opposition. They simply asked for boldness to speak God's word and for God to show himself strong through the name of Jesus. And God answered that prayer immediately. And it says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Did you know that you can pray the same prayer that they prayed? And the same God is able to answer the same prayer in the same way? Now, in chapter five, after the apostles are arrested again, we see the wisdom in their prayer, not asking for God to end the opposition because it was in this very opposition that Peter was provided yet another opportunity to preach the gospel, this time to the religious rulers. As Peter began right where he left off last time saying, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Wow, once again, what happened to Peter? Well, once again, Pentecost happened to Peter. This is Peter after the promised baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is the difference between being filled with the Holy Spirit and overflowing, baptized with the Holy Spirit. The difference is distinct. It's undeniable, isn't it? Is that something that you want for yourself to be filled with the structural stability and power of overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit so that you could take your stand and testify boldly, powerfully the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, remember what Peter said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as he preached in Acts chapter two. The promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Just ask him simply in faith now. Just say, Jesus, please, according to your promise, baptize me with the Holy Spirit. I humbly receive all the spiritual gifts that you want to give me and please release me for the work of ministry. Really, seriously, if you want him to do this, ask him right now, follow after me. Jesus, please, according to your promise, baptize me with the Holy Spirit. I humbly receive all the spiritual gifts that you want to give me and release me for the work of ministry. Now, simply thank him in faith for answering your prayer. Just say, thank you, Jesus, for baptizing me with the Holy Spirit. Now, as you read today, the religious rulers really couldn't come up with a good plan of what to do with the apostles. Wanting to just kill them, Gamaliel stepped in with good logic. Look, let them go. If this is not from God, it will all eventually just go away. If it is from God and you fight them on this, you'll find yourself fighting against God. So submitting to his counsel, they beat the apostles and let them go, commanding them once again, not to preach, not to teach in the name of Jesus. And then the last two verses that we read today were the best, weren't they? It says, so they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name and daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. <laughs>